Yes. <laughs> uh, well, what a privilege to be here this morning and in the house of the Lord. Isn't that a great place to be? Um, just what we were singing, um, it truly is the best place to be. And um, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. So, yeah. This morning we're going to carry on on our series we've been doing better together. And um, our message this morning is a place to belong. And what a beautiful um, service to have this message in, having the child dedications this morning, the babies, um, just to see them brought into the house of God, into the family of God. And um, I feel like half the message is preached already with what we've done. Um, and even yesterday, um, in, in our ladies gathering together, just um, coming together to connect, to have some fun, some fellowship, and beautiful Selena shared about being better together, together better. Um, and it's just all the Lord, I believe it's what the Lord is speaking to the church at the moment, isn't it? That we are better together. Ephesians 2, chapter 19 says, now you are no longer strangers to God and foreigners to heaven, but you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. That's beautiful, isn't it? You belong in God's household with every other Christian. We all need to belong. It's a human basic need, isn't it? Love and belonging are the, the basic things that we need for our survival. And when I think of belonging, I think of family. Um, and um, most of you know, but um, I'm married to Ray, who's not here at the moment. Um, and we have three daughters who are 20, 28, 25, and 23. Um, and the last time we were all together was um, our eldest daughter, Amy, and her husband, Jaden's wedding. Um, there's a picture here. Um, which was nearly two and a half years ago now. Uh, but that's yeah, the last time because our middle daughter, Cassidy, is over in Seoul, Korea. So we haven't seen her for a while. But um, weddings anyway are precious, precious times, aren't they? Precious family moments. And then um, last year in July, we went down to Christchurch because the other two girls are living in Christchurch. Um, so Ray and I went down there and just had special family time hanging out together. We um, usually, when the cruisers get together, there's food. <laughs> and this one was a, a Filipino restaurant down in Christchurch, so that was Filipino food. And the next one is, um, Cassidy wasn't there, but this was Korean food, Korean chicken, karage chicken. Um, so um, fellowship over food and just, just hanging out together, making memories. And that's what it's about, isn't it? And after that trip, I came back up, up here and back to work, and I just I felt like my spirit was singing, like I was filled with family time. And you know, isn't that what, what happens when we are together? We create memories, and then it brings a smile to our face when, we, when we're separated, but we recall our, our loved ones and, and those precious times. And there's a longing when we're apart. You know, at times I've thought about Cassidy, particularly during COVID when if anything happened, we couldn't get to each other. Um, and it's just, you know, you feel so homesick for one another. And yeah, so family is such a special thing and God created us for family, didn't he? So we're called to belong, not just believe. God said in the Garden of Eden, it is not good for man to be alone. We are created for community, we're fashioned for fellowship, and we are formed for a family. None of us can fulfill God's purposes on our own. The Bible says we are put together, joined together, built together, members together, heirs together, fitted together, held together, and we'll be caught up together. That's a lot of togethers, isn't it? <laughs> so you are not on your own anymore. When you come into the family of God, you, you have a family. 
And while our relationship to God is personal, it's never intended to be private. In God's family, we're connected to every other believer. And we will be for eternity. We'll belong to each other for eternity. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. It's quite an amazing thought, isn't it? Each member belongs to all the others. So like a natural family, we are connected forever. And in, in families, we might fight with each other, siblings fight each other, but usually when the chips are down, when, when there's something come against us, we will fight together. We'll fight for each other, won't we? So following Christ includes belonging, not just believing. We are members of his body. It's not like members of a club or a loyalty program or, you know, member can be used as a very loose term, can't it? But we are members of the church, and that means being a member of a vital uh, orga- like a, a vital organ of a living body, an indispensable, interconnected part of the body of Christ. The church is a body, it's not a building. It's an organism, not an organization. For the organs of your body to fulfill their purpose, they must be connected to your body. That's fairly obvious, isn't it? And the same is true for us as part of God's body. I just want to read um, a, a great scripture, and we'll be familiar with it, but 1 Corinthians 12, the verses here that talk about the body. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts, many parts, form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honourable we treat with special honour, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. So we were created for a specific role, but we can miss the purpose of what God has for us if we're not attached to a living local church. You discover your role in life through Uh, through your relationships with others. The scripture we read before, Romans 12, 4 to 5, in the message version, says, Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of this body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? If an organ is somehow severed from its bod- from the body, it's going to shrivel up and die, isn't it? We, someone, your toe gets cut off and 
that it's not quickly reattached by someone very clever, then um, it's, it's going to die. It's going to be no use. Disconnected and cut off from the life of the local body, our spiritual life will wither and eventually die. Ephesians 4.16 From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The first symptom of spiritual decline is usually inconsistent um, attendance at worship services and other gatherings of believers. What, whenever we become careless about fellowship, everything else begins to slide too. Membership in the family of God is not in, inconsequential nor something to be casually ignored. The church is God's agenda for the world. Let me say that again. The church is God's agenda for the world. He uses us individually to reach out and to, to touch people and, and bring people to Christ. But there is something powerful about Christians together and how he can use us as an, um, a witness to the world, isn't there? Jesus said, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. The church is indestructible. It will exist for eternity. It will outlive this universe, and so will your role in it. And the person who says, I don't need the church, is either uh, arrogant or ignorant. The church is so significant that Jesus died for it. Ephesians 5.25 says Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. We, we don't always think about that. He gave his life for me as an individual, we know, but he gave his life for the church, which is all of us collectively. The Bible calls the church the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. I can't imagine saying to Jesus, I love you, but I don't like your wife. Or, I accept you, but I reject your body. But we do this whenever we dismiss or demean or complain about the church. God commands us to love the church as much as Jesus does. 1 Peter 2.17 says, Love your spiritual family. Or another version, Love the brotherhood of believers. Sadly, many Christians use the church, but they don't love it. I was thinking about this and I was thinking back to when I was a teenager and why I would go to church then. And if I'm honest, I probably went more often to catch up with my friends, to hang out with them than to worship or, or meet with God. I went to please my parents or to meet the expectations that the pastor's daughter should be at every church service. Um, and since that time, I've often thought about why why I'm coming to church? And it's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Am I coming because I love God and I love the family of God? Or am I coming because I should, because it's expected, because it makes me look good? Am I serving so that I can prove that I'm okay, I can keep up with everybody? Or do I really have a heart of love for God and for my brothers and sisters? Almost every time the word church is used in the Bible, it refers to a local, visible congregation. The New Testament assumes membership in a local congregation. It says that a Christian without a church is like an organ without a body, a sheep without a flock, or a child without a family. It's an unnatural state. Ephesians 2.19 says, You belong in God's household with every other Christian. Today's culture of independent individualism has created many spiritual orphans, bunny believers who hop around from one church to another uh, without any identity, accountability or commitment. Many believe you can be a good Christian without joining or even attending a local church, but the word of God would disagree with that. The Bible offers many compelling reasons why, being, why we should be committed and active in a local fellowship. So we'll look at why you need a church family, and there's six points here. 
The first one is that a, fam a church family identifies you as a genuine believer. Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. When we come together from different backgrounds, cultures, race, social status, it is a powerful witness to the world. You are not the body of Christ on your own. I can't be the body of Christ on my own. We need others to express that. Together, not separated, we are his body. Number two, a church family moves you out of self-centered isolation. The local church is the classroom for learning to get along in God's family. It's a lab for practicing unselfish, sympathetic love. As a participating member, we learn to care about others and, um, and share the experiences of others. As we read before, if one part of the body suffers, all the parts suffer with it. Or if one part of our body is honored, all the other parts share its honor. Only in regular contact with ordinary, imperfect believers can we learn real fellowship and experience the New Testament truth of being connected and dependent on each other. Biblical fellowship is being as committed to each other as we are to Christ Jesus. God expects us to give our lives for each other. We know John 3.16, but do we always look at John, 1 John 3.16, which says, Jesus Christ lay down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That's quite a, a big thing, isn't it? We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And when you think about it as a parent, you know that you would lay down your life for your kids. When, when they are sick, you'd rather you were suffering than they, they are. And that's the way we're to be with our church family, is to be really ready to lay down our lives for one another. This is the kind of sacrificial love that God expects us to show other believers, a willingness to love them in the same way that God loves us. And the third one is a church family helps you develop spiritual muscle. You'll never grow to maturity just by attending worship services and being a, a passive spectator. Only participation in the full life of a church builds spiritual muscle. The Bible says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy, growing, and full of love. Over 50 times in the New Testament, the phrase one another or each other is used. We are commanded to love each other, pray for each other, encourage each other, uh, admonish one another, greet one another, serve one another, teach one another, accept one another, honor one another, bear each other's burdens, forgive one another, submit to one another, be devoted to each other. This is m biblical membership. These are our family responsibilities that God expects us to fulfill through a local fellowship. Who are we doing these with? It may seem easier to be holy when there's no one else around to frustrate our preferences, but that's a false, untested holiness. You know, I, before I got married, I thought I was quite, quite holy, quite, <laughs> quite a good person. And then you get married and, and your spouse reflects back to you some of the things that aren't so good and you realize, oh, okay, <laughs> not as good as I thought I was. And then you have kids. And, and even more, it brings out all this stuff that you didn't think you had within you. Um, so, that, yeah, we, we need others around to, so that we can see ourselves and that we can grow. Isolation breeds deceitfulness. It's easy to fool ourselves into thinking we are mature if there's no one else around to challenge us. Real maturity shows up in relationships. We need more than the Bible in order to grow. We need other believers. We grow faster and stronger by um, learning from each other and being accountable to each other. 
It can be far more difficult, far more frustrating, it can be painful because we, we're, we're not perfect. We hurt each other. We, we cause each other to, to stumble sometimes. It's, it's painful. But, but we learn to forgive, to bear with each other and to love one another. And when others share what God is teaching them, I grow too. I love to hear from, from others. You know, we learn new insights. The fourth one is the body of Christ needs you. God has a unique role for each of us to play in his family. This is called our ministry. And God has gifted us for this assignment. He's gifted you for an assignment in your local church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us as a means of helping the entire church. Your local fellowship is the place God designed for you to discover, develop, and use your gifts. We are all unique. No one else can fill your place. When you are missing from us, we, there's something missing. We miss you. We are all needed. And I know all of us at different times think, oh, nobody notices if I'm not there. But, but we do. We need each other. There's a hole, and, and we need to fulfill what God's given us. You know, so many times in my life I've, I've looked at others, and I thought, oh, if only I was more like so-and-so, if, if I could do that, if I was a bit bolder, if I was a bit louder, if I wasn't so quiet. But God has given each of us a gift and, and we have to find that gift and, and operate in that place where God's called us. And when we do that, it, it's beautiful. It brings the body together. It, it brings the whole picture. Yeah. And we encourage one another, don't we? We can point out, you know, encourage each other and say, wow, when you do that, you know, it's amazing. And that helps us. It builds our confidence. Number five, you will share in Christ's mission in the world. When Jesus walked the earth, God worked, worked through the physical body of Christ, but now he's working through his spiritual body, which is us. The church is God's instrument on, on earth. We're not just to model God's love by loving each other. We are to carry it together to the rest of the world. It's an incredible privilege we've been given together. As members of Christ's body, we are his hands, his feet, his voice, his eyes, his heart. He works through us in the world. We each have a contribution to make. Paul says he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. And the sixth one, a church family will keep you from backsliding. None of us are immune to temptation. Given the right situation, you and I are capable of any sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And God knows this, so he's assigned us as individuals with the responsibility of keeping each other on track. The Bible says in Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Mind your own business isn't a Christian phrase. Although it might be appropriate if we're not genuinely asking things with a heart of love and the right motivation for someone, if our motive is to find out the gossip so we can pass it on, then we should be told to mind our own business. But we are called and commanded to be involved in each other's lives. If you know someone who's wavering spiritually right now, then it's your responsibility to go out and to bring them back into the fellowship. James 5.19 says, If you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off. Go after them. Get them back. And a related benefit of a local church is that it also provides you with spiritual leaders. And that's a protection. God gives shepherd leaders the responsibility to guard, protect, defend, and care for the spiritual welfare of his flock. 
we are told their work is to watch over your souls and they know they are accountable to God. Satan loves detached believers, unplugged from the life of the body, isolated from God's family and unaccountable to spiritual leaders because he knows they are defenseless and powerless against his tactics. I don't know if you remember on the news last year there was a story of a baby orca that was um, separated from its pod that was stranded and there were a lot of people around trying to keep it safe and hope that it could be reunited with its pod but uh, sadly that didn't happen and um, it, it died and that's that's an illustration of what happens to us when we get separated from the body isolated out on our own we we won't survive we need each other being part of a healthy church is essential to living a healthy life the main prior main activities of the church are worship fellowship discipleship ministry and evangelism worship helps you focus on god Fellowship helps you face life, life's problems. That's what we do when we're coming together. Discipleship helps fortify your faith. Ministry helps find your talents. And evangelism helps fulfill your mission. There is nothing, on, nothing else on earth like the church. You know, when a child is born, it's born into the universal family of human beings but it also needs a specific family where it can be nurtured and, and brought up and grow to be healthy and strong. And the same is true for us spiritually. When we're born again, we're born into the universal family of God, um, but you also need to become a member of a local expression of God's family. The difference between being a church attender and a church member is commitment. Attenders are spectators from the sidelines. Members get involved in the ministry. Attenders are consumers. Members are contributors. Attenders want the benefits of a church without sharing the responsibility. That's worth thinking about, isn't it? Why is it important to join a local church family? because it proves you are committed to your spiritual brothers and sisters in reality, not just in theory. God wants you to love real people, not ideal people. You can spend a lifetime searching for the perfect church, but you will never find it. As Jermaine said, this church isn't, neither is any other one that I've ever been to. You are called to love imperfect sinners, just as God does. You know, it's all part of God's plan, I think. If there was a perfect church, then we wouldn't, wouldn't need each other. We wouldn't need to call on God. We wouldn't be learning and growing the way we do when we rub shoulders and um, do life together. In Acts, the Christians in Jerusalem were very specific in their commitment to each other. They were devoted to fellowship. The Bible says they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. And God expects us to do the same thing today. The Christian life is more than just commitment to Christ. It's a commitment to members, to, uh, to other Christians and members of the church. You know, for most of us, this is nothing really new. We, we know that we are, um, you know, we're to be committed into a local fellowship. But uh, sometimes I think we need reminding of why, why we come together on a Sunday. Why do we gather together? And, and during the week, why do we have these meetings? Because we can become very casual about church and our attendance and our involvement. Sometimes we become apathetic or even critical. We need reminding of God's purpose of his church, the body, and the importance of commitment to it. As many of you know, um, my husband Ray is in the Philippines. He's there for a couple of months. And I've been so blessed during this time, as a number of you have reached out to me, um, 
gathered around, you invited me out for a walk, for a coffee, for a meal. I've been given flowers. And I've just felt so loved and cared for in this time. And then in the last few weeks, our son-in-law's father became critically ill. And sadly, he passed away. And that was been really hard without Ray here. But the comfort I've received from you, my brothers and sisters, has just made all the difference. It's been amazing. I just know that I'm not alone. And, and I'm so grateful for that. I know the love of the family that I belong to is a genuine care. And, and that's the beauty of Christian fellowship, that we can be there for one another in the hard times as well as in the good times. You know, these days seem to be getting harder in lots of ways. And the enemy will, wants to pick us off if we are not strongly connected together. We can work together. We can cover one another. We can protect one another. The enemy is using all kinds of tactics to pull us apart right now. And it seems like he's winning sometimes. But we need to intentionally lock arms with our brothers and sisters and commit to each other and say, for better or for worse, we are together. We are family. Our verse to remember from this is Romans 12, 5. In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We belong to each other. We belong to each other, each and every one of us. There's no, no one here who should sit there and say, yeah, that's everybody else, it's not me. It is all of us, every single person, younger, older, whether you've been here five minutes or 50 years, it doesn't matter. We all belong together. The question that we have today is, does my level of involvement in my local church demonstrate that I love and am committed to God's family? Does my level of involvement in my local church demonstrate that I love and am committed to God's family? Let's keep that in mind and think about that even during this week. You know, the events of recent months and, and the last couple of years have caused many Christians to question the church and their involvement in it, many things about it. It's been hard for all of us, every single person. It's been hard. So let's think about this question and what is God asking of us? Where are we meant to be? Where are we going to put our roots down deep and say, I'm here and I am here for you, my brothers and sisters. We are in this together. What I'd like us to do now, rather than have come time for coming up the front, is just for us to pray with the person beside you, or just two or three, and you might want to pray for a greater sense of belonging. You might feel like you're not, not feeling connected like you, you need to, like you want to. You might pray that you would know your gifting or what your role is in the body. You might need to pray to confess that you've been critical of the church, this church, other churches, the church worldwide, whatever it is, we, are, we need to have a right attitude towards it. You might just want to pray for the body of Christ um, in, in our land and across the world. The body needs prayer. There's great attack against it at the moment, all kinds of ways. We see it every day. And if we're going to withstand these attacks, if we're going to stand, we need to stand together. I'll just just pray and then, then let's just join in for a few minutes, just have, have some prayer. Father, I just thank you for, for the body of Christ. I thank you for the family of believers. And that your design is amazing. Your design is perfect. Lord, we're not perfect, but what you have designed is. And Father, I thank you for every single person here today, those who are not here, those who are watching online, those who, who are unable to be here. Lord, each one of us is precious. Each one of us is needed in your body. And I pray that you would lead us on from here, 
Help us to find our place. Help us to connect in. Lord, may we be a strong, connected body. This church, other churches in our town, across the the valley and uh, in our nation and beyond, Lord, may the church stand strong. Teach us, Father, how we can commit to one another. Help us to prioritize being there for one another when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. Lord, let us truly love one another that the world might see what you have planned, what you desire for the church, that we would be a witness that people would come because they would see the love that flows between us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool, let's spend a couple of minutes just praying with one another, eh?
Okay, you're uh, free to continue to pray, but uh, we're going to uh, share lunch together. Uh, there's also a uh, bouncy castle in the gym for the kids. Uh, I guess there's a couple of rules as there's no food in there, nor is there any shoes as well. Um, parents, please look after your kids. And uh, when we uh, share lunch and we eat, um, yeah, kids, please look out. Uh, sorry, kids. Parents, please look after your kids uh, as we um, share lunch.